redemption, uh, I want to put it into biblical context. Uh, if if um, you, uh, someone asked me the question just now, you know, well, what if you do something wrong? Uh, surely then, you know, uh, things can happen. Well, let me explain something to you. Uh, Judas Iscariot plotted to, um, with the high priest to deliver Christ into their hands, didn't he? Was well, that right or not? Now, Judas was going totally against God, wasn't he? All right? But you read in the scriptures that he was delivered by the determinate counsel of God. You say, but Judas betrayed him. Yeah, but God planned it. He said, one that sitteth with, with, with me has raised up his hand against me. Uh, and it was all that it might be fulfilled. He said, have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is the devil? <laughs> um, don't ever get the idea that the devil has control of anything or wickedness. No, no, no one. God is in total control. It was all predetermined. God decided. So you always have to, when, when you live in life, you begin to realize um, lots of people panic when things happen. Don't panic. God's in control. Don't worry. Don't jump out of your pram. It's all right. Um, God really is in control. Uh, you think, oh, the devil is the devil. The devil, nothing. Poor devil is finished. I mean, you just get, grow up um, and, and stop getting all your... You end up in superstition and, and fear. And we don't need to be afraid of anything. I will not fear what man can do to me. It, it really is. Um, there is a lot of mythology. People come to me and say, Oh, did you know what so-and-so is doing? Well, they're a so-and-so, so why do I need to know? Um, it doesn't matter. Lots of people will plot. They always do. It's part of the package. Um, if Jesus chose 12 and one of them was a devil, why do you think you're going to have a better average? Um, there'll always be the traders around. Always. There'll always be that spirit around. So, you, But it doesn't affect you. It only strengthens. Trial of your faith is much more precious than fine gold. It, it, it just strengthens you. Um, the only time it ever affects you is if you let it get inside you. Then it will affect you. But if you don't let it get inside you, well, so let them do their worst. Who cares? I don't. Uh, it, it, you don't then you don't have to strive. You only strive. People get into terrible strifes and, you know, well, what about this, what about that? You know, if I make a mistake, will God... Uh, there's a, a kind of theory, you know, people uh, feel that if they do something wrong, then maybe God will withdraw his hand. Well, he won't. He said, no one can pluck you out of my hand. And to be honest with you, you can't pluck yourself out either. It's just a nice idea people have that somehow their destiny is related to what they do. It isn't. It's related. Redemption's related to what God does for us. Okay? You'll make a thousand mistakes. That doesn't bother God. He didn't expect any better of you. But what you've got to realize is that God is your redemption. He's your sanctification. He, he, he's everything. Um, a pastor that preaches always and lectures people on what they must do and mustn't do and doesn't preach Christ and, and lots of pastors spend all their time telling people what they must and mustn't do and don't preach Christ but really in the end we want to preach the goodness of God because it's the goodness of God that leads a man to salvation not telling him he's going to hell not telling him you know what a failure he is people know they're a failure what they need to know is how to succeed. People know they're dead beats. What they want to know is how to stop beating the dead. Uh, and, you know, that's the way life is. 
All right? Um, turn with me quickly. We've just, I just want to knock you through a few scriptures. Because to me, um, without the scripture, you're lost. Redemption has to do with more than um, more than just um, the idea of uh, of um, forgiveness of sins. And turn with me to Genesis chapter one. Genesis chapter one. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 and God said Genesis 1 26 and God said let us make man in our image after our likeness now what you have to understand is God's will is that you're made in the image and in the likeness of God. Man is made in the image and likeness of God. Man is not made like an animal. Man is not made like, man is made like God. When God created everything, he, he determined that that was how you were to be, God-like. And, um, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Now God intends man to have dominion only over the animals, over the creepy crawlies, over every... He doesn't say have dominion over each other. And the problem is when the fall came, man took the dominion over the animals to be dominion over each other and everything got out of kilter that's why you get churches where the pastor is always trying to assert himself uh, and always trying to dominate oh, God didn't call us um, if anyone wants to be Lord let him be servant of all um, God's not called us to dominate people's lives we're here to preach the gospel lift up Jesus it's up to you what you do with it you're free to come free to go I can't make people do what's right I can preach the principle of God but whether you're going to live it is up to you isn't it um, there is no compulsion you can't make anyone do anything they don't want to do because they won't um, the older you get the more stupid you get and that's the way it is you can't no one can compel anyone to do anything and that's why whomsoever will may come People are free to come, free to go. And always, that's the way it is. And dominion was given over, only over, look at it. It says, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. That means if you're a fisherman, you know God intended you to have dominion. I went uh, fly fishing just on Thursday. I like to go fly fishing. And I walked down the bank as is, is my one, um, Ian was with me and I was what, looking for fish, you see, because I like to look for what I catch. No point in, you know, I'm not, fly fishing is, the water's as clear as gin. Not a gin and orange, a gin. Um, and, and you can see the fish and then you choose the one you're going to fish for. Uh, to, to sit at a bank and just wait in case something comes along would drive me bananas. I like to be able to walk and see. Uh, and as I was walking on the bank, I said to Ian, I said, look, there's a blue there. And there was. And I just saw its tail and fin. So I stood there and waited because I intended to catch it. Because that's the way it is. You select what you want. And it was hidden right under stuff, um, uh, weeds coming out. And it hid right underneath, right in the bank. You could just see its tail, and a little bit of it. So I waited, and sure enough, in a few minutes, along came 
two other uh, rainbow trout, and as they um, went under the weed, they pushed this one that was under the weed out, and it fell back down the river. It just let itself float back, back down the river. And there was about that much room before it could get back to the weed. It just floated back, and it was going to go back to where it was. So at that point, I just flicked the fly on the... Well, it was a nymph, actually. Just exactly between the weed and the fish, and bang, got it. 14-pounder. Um, and that was it. You know, now that, God gave me dominion over the fish of the sea. <laughs> uh, I like that kind of challenge. Uh, that kind of challenge I enjoy. Uh, it's, um, it's just the way. God, God intends us to have dominion over those things. But not over, uh, the, the, when you fish in the gospel, you become a fisher of men. Um, you, you do it in the same way. To me, there is no point in kind of casting, uh, you know, out uh, over everywhere and talking to everyone. Because I know this, that when you start to talk to people, there are people that begin to open and you know they're ready. They come out from the weeds and they float back down the river and there's just that much. And you know, right bait and you've got them. Uh, and you can apply the gospel uh, and they'll respond. And there's a lot of other people that are well hidden under the weeds. You're wasting your time, casting. All you do is not your line. You won't get them. Uh, and so you know you've got to wait. And there's always an opportunity. God always gives it. And at that opportunity, you've got to be ready to drop in the right bait. But God doesn't give you dominion over them. Uh, that is why uh, in life, there's no sense in which we should have dominion. Everyone is made in the image and likeness of God. It's just that sin sullies that image. Uh, sin destroys, sin nature destroys and God wants to restore us to what we were don't ever get the idea that um, it's um, not so verse 27 so God created man in his own image in the image of God created he him male and female created he them in fact women also were created in the image of God uh, the scripture said so so I must believe it um, <laughs> well, <laughs> oh, well, what can one say? Uh, uh, and God intends to restore us. Sin marred us. The nature marred us. And redemption brings us back to that which God intended. And that is the most important thing to understand. Redemption is to restore what we lost. When you redeem something, you purchase it. And when you redeem it, you bring it out of the condition it was in. That's why you're translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. You're translated back into what God always intended. God intends everyone to be in his image and likeness and to behave in his image and likeness. And you need to know what God's like in order to know whether you're behaving in his image and likeness. That's why the written word of God's there. You need to know Christ came to reveal what God was like in man. That's why he's called the second Adam. Because the first Adam lost his sinless state. The second Adam lived in it. And so you can know what God is like by Jesus Christ because he was man and God wasn't he God incomprehensibly made man as they put in the hymn uh, and we can look at Christ and understand how we should be in the earth we should be in the image and likeness of God we should have the compassion of God the care of God we should have uh, the tenderness of God we should have the righteousness of God we're in the image and likeness of God because we've been redeemed. 
And that is God's purpose for every single one, to restore us and to bring us back into what we should have been, um, that which Adam and Eve lost. And Christ, when he came, he just came to do that, to redeem us. That's why he shed his blood, so that we might have the life in our soul. Because you remember Adam and Eve were created living souls. God breathed, he made them, and then he breathed into them. They became a living soul. The spirit and the body coming together makes a living soul. And the soul comprises of your mind, your emotions, and your will. And the three things that govern you. Those are the three things that comprise your soul. And they have to be transformed into the image of God. That's why you have to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Your mind needs renewing. It's been perverted by the world. It's perverted by the way people are. And that, that needs renewing. That's nothing to do with the devil. Get the devil out of it. Uh, sin's the problem, the devil isn't. My Bible didn't say Jesus Christ came to redeem us from the devil. He came to redeem us from sin. Once you take sin out of the equation and you put people back into um, the image and likeness of God, well, the devil's not involved. Once you're translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son, the devil doesn't live there. You do. And so the devil's not in it. Uh, if a Christian's always thinking of the devil, then he's not a Christian. You don't need a devil to help you sin. You're capable without any help, aren't you? If you want to do the wrong thing and your desire, and it's only the desires. James says this, you sin uh, by your natural desires, the lust. Um, when, when you see something and you desire it, then basically it conceives. And when it's ended, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it's ended, brings forth death. But it doesn't mention the devil. It's you. And Christians have got to realize, now, I know the devil will take people at his will. He goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But he can't devour a child of God. Can't even come near them. That's why my Bible says, resist the devil, he'll flee from you. He just, he's got no power. <laughs> he looks at you and says, oh, not one of them, and he's off. When you turn up in a place, he makes himself scarce. Why? Well, there's a child of God there, and he knows he has no defense against you. He has no defense against truth. Darkness can't overcome light. Light always overcomes darkness. <laughs> He's lost. Do you understand that? The only way in other people's lives he can have power is if they give their will to it. If you want to believe a lie and want to live a lie, then he has power over your life. If you want to go after what's deception he has power but if you want to walk in truth in light in honesty in openness the devil is powerless and a lot of the teaching today in the church is really binding people up and all this kind of fasting and praying and beating yourself is unbiblical totally unbiblical totally untrue and people get an idea that it's somehow spiritual it's not never has been uh, the true fast of God, as I said, is in Isaiah. I'm made in the image and likeness of God. God's not sitting in heaven going hungry. God's not sitting in heaven to kind of say, oh dear, I've really got to do something to overcome the devil. 2,000 years ago he came to set us free. It's over. Poor devil. He's finished. Do you know the one third of the hosts of heaven that fell, they're reserved in chains. They're not wandering around trying to get us. They're already chained. It says so in um, Jude. And if you start believing your Bible, it's very easy. People love to deify the devil. He's, he's defeated. Non-entity. Finished. That's if you're a Christian. Of course, if you're one of these people that wants to be one of these ministers and go around chasing devils up drain pipes well good luck to you I don't I've got better things to do with my life I'd rather talk on truth than error wouldn't you huh? 
I'd rather talk about Jesus. Who cares? The devil. Poor smutty face. He's finished. Uh, and when you get that kind of view of things and understand redemption, it ends all that nonsense. I, I, I'm just writing a book, or, or when I say I'm writing it, I'm getting other people to transcribe my sermons. Uh, and uh, spiritual warfare, question mark. And underneath the truth, I know mean, there's a load of rubbish. Jesus accomplished, the warfare is accomplished. It's over. Why don't we believe it? Huh? I'm redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. It's what he's done already. Uh, and you don't need, you know, to have special uh, water to sprinkle in your house to get demons out. When I walk into a building, that's the end. Devil goes out. If he were there, he'd go out. <laughs> Not staying around here. He can't, because we're light. He's dark. Hmm? When daylight comes, what does darkness do? Fight it? It has no power. He's a day spring from on high, isn't he? Well, so anywhere you go, he's finished. Now the only reason people remain in deception is because that's what they want. The only reason people remain in error is that's what they choose. They choose to. And God won't violate their will. It's not that the devil's got them. It's not that... It's just choice. If you're wrong today, if your life's a mess today, it's because that's what you want it to be. Because Christ has made full redemption for us. Huh? Look at uh, John's, um, the epistle of John. Remember the scripture I quoted? We're meant to be in the image and likeness of God. And the great apostle of love writes this. In uh, third epistle of John, and I've preached it in the church. Here it is. Stick this if you want a promise box. Here's a good promise. I wouldn't box it if I was you. I would look after it. Um, here it is. Beloved, I wish above all things that read it again. Read it again. Read it again. That's the third epistle of John, verse 2. Read it again. Now here's an apostle writing and saying, Beloved, I wish above all things. Well, if he wishes it above all things, do you think he was wishing the will of God? Yes. Well, was he? Yes. Was he a man of God, John? Yes. Was he an apostle of God? Yes. So God's will for everyone is that they yes. prosper and yes. be in health. It's better to be in health than to be healed, isn't it? I wish above all things thou mayest prosper. Prosperity, as I was saying last week, prosperity is the main thing I believe in. I mean, I, I think poverty is an evil. If you're poor and, and you're downtrodden, that's evil. Uh, it takes a little folding of the hands, a little sitting down, and then poverty comes. That's how you get poor. Get up, do something. God wants to prosper the work of your hands. If you, your hands don't work, no, nothing will prosper. And, and God's will is for us to prosper and be in health, even as our soul prospers. 
Now our soul prospers, man shall live by every word that proceeds out the mouth of God. And health comes by believing what God says. And prosperity comes by living by his principles. And God has made full provision for our life. God knows what I need, doesn't he? Huh? Well, doesn't he? Now, he knows that redemption is useless if I'm going to drop off my perch dead the next moment. I'm not redeemed, I'm dead. Uh, God knows that if I, I live in total poverty and abject, uh, abject, abject, uh, abject despair, there's no use. Redemption's not working. And if everything in my life is bondage and terror, redemption's not working. Redemption's to redeem me from that life and bring me into the image and likeness of God. God isn't sitting in heaven panicking. God isn't sitting in heaven saying, Oh dear, it's a terrible day today. Now you're created to be in the image and likeness of God. And God, everything that your hand is put to prospers. Everything God intends prospers. God has always set his hand to prosper, not to fail. And yet Christians have this idea of it's acceptable to be depressed. It's not. A Christian doesn't get depressed. You can't. Why? Well, if you prosper and you're in health, what have you got to be depressed about? Huh? Nothing. Ah, you glorify God, don't you? Isn't it wonderful? God's good all the time. Amen? And so Christianity, redemption, when it works in your life, it's just a glorious thing. No, hey, I, I'm redeemed. I'm not miserable. Why? Because God's, the benefit of redemption works in my life. The Alpha and the Omega and the work in between is glorious. God didn't intend me to spend my life suffering. God took my suffering. Jesus bore my suffering. He suffered that I might live. He didn't suffer so I could learn how to suffer. He suffered that I might get out of suffering. Redemption's redeeming me from the curse of the law. Redemption isn't dumping the bigger curse on me. Now you're a Christian, everything's going to be hard. Now you're a Christian, everything's going to be miserable. Now you're a Christian, oh, it's a hard life. Oh, it's not, it's easy. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. It's easy. You know, redemption that's not redeeming you is not worth anything, is it? Well, once I was a sinner. And I did the, I, I listened to the testimonies of people. Once I was a sinner, you know, I did this wrong, I did that wrong. And now, praise God, I'm saved. And since then, my life's boring. Uh, I've let God down many times, but he's never let me down. Ra, ra, ra. That is not a testimony of God's grace. It's disgusting. Hey, God's good. Huh? Look, look, look in the scriptures. Let, let's take it. You're in the image of God. Tell me, what type of mansion does God live in? New Jerusalem. How are the streets paved? With gold. Turn with me to um, Psalm 84. Verse 9 of 84 says, Behold, O God our shield, and look upon the face of thine anointed, for a day in thy courts is better than a, th than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. 
Now, verse 11 says, No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. That means if you still believe in Darwin and you think you came from a monkey and don't walk upright, you've got a problem. But if you walk uprightly in righteousness and truth, no good thing will he withhold. Now, what does no good thing mean? Anything you see that's good, God says you can have it. Everything. If you walk in God's principles and God's way, no good thing is he going to withhold. Nothing that's good is God ever going to stop you having. I like that. Don't you? Now it just depends whether you'll live by faith or by your fear and stupidity. I believe what God says. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Verse 5, Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, and in whose heart are the ways of them. Um, who passing through the valley of Baca make it a well. The rain also filleth the pools. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them in Zion appeareth before God. You're meant to go from strength to strength. What you're not meant to do is be, oh, I'm so weak. You're going from strength to strength. Hey, everything in your life should be from strength to strength, not from strength to weakness. Don't ever get the idea that somehow you're destroyed. You're not. God intends you to go on. Um, God always intends me to get more. Hmm? I love it. He says, no good thing will he withhold. That's why I like to go and look at good things. No point in going and looking at bad things, is there? But if I go and look at good things, I say, God, you can't withhold that from me. Glory to God. <laughs> you know, when I, when I go, I, I go to a restaurant, I look at all the good things on a menu. I know no good thing will he withhold from me. When, when I'm out, I, I look, you know, you see, I, I, I like to look at the positive. Hmm. Now, some things aren't good. Those he doesn't want you to have, only because they'll hurt you. But good things he wants you to have. God doesn't want you to have bad things. Good things. Hmm? It's important to understand that. Everything that's good is for me. You see, God designed this earth for the sons of God. He designed us to be in his image. He said that everything, would, you know, we're, we're to subdue. Take dominion over the fish, you know, birds, fowls of the air. Every good thing. God gave it to us. We've got a glorious inheritance. You go in society, look at a good thing, say, he, he won't withhold it from you. He'll give you the ability to get it. Not to nick it. <laughs> to get it. You know, don't think no good thing will he withhold. So you go and break into someone's house and say, well, God said he, you know, he wouldn't withhold it, so I'm having it. That is called stealing. Uh, God didn't intend that, but God intended to so prosper us and so bless us that no good thing does he withhold. Uh, and that's the way it is. Christians in a wonderful position. He looks at everything in life, he looks at everything in the world, and he said, there's nothing that God's going to keep from me. He won't withhold it. And he owns everything. And that's the wonder of it all. Look, um, let's just quickly look. Uh, Haggai, you know, I, I referred to this in the meeting the other day. And if you can't find Haggai because you're one of these people that can't, go to Malachi and go one book back. And you'll find Zechariah. Then go to second book back. And you will come across... Haggai, okay? okay? 
Here is something that you need to understand. Verse 8, God says, read it out. Who owns all the silver in the world? Who owns all the gold? He says, all mine. Now, if it belongs to God, he won't withhold it. I always worry when churches are poor. Church can't be poor because all the silver's God's, all the gold's God's. Say, so, but the bank owns it. The bank don't own it, God owns it. All the silver's mine, all the gold's mine. People have the idea of somehow thinking, uh, when a church is always looking for money, there's something wrong. Something definitely wrong. When they're always taking collections, there's something wrong. When they're always pushing people for money, there's something wrong. All the silver's mine, all the gold's mine. That doesn't mean you, you give your uh, old clothes to the church so they can flog them. That's disgusting. You know, jumble sales, and that's not a way for the church of God to live. God doesn't want your cast-offs. It's wrong. Evil. Um, God says, look, all the silver's mine, all the gold's mine. No good thing will I withhold. Redemption's part of coming to the um, place where you see, hey, everything belongs to God. Exodus 19. Uh, verse 5 says now therefore if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people for all the earth is huh? mine uh, you shall be a peculiar people above all people you're a peculiar treasure to God do you know God looks on you as peculiar and you're a peculiar treasure to God and above all people there is no people on earth more blessed than the people of God and, and he says look all the earth's mine you're going to be a peculiar treasure in this earth why you're in the image and likeness of God no one else is only truly born again people who are living and restored to the image and likeness of God they're a peculiar treasure no good thing will he withhold from them. The silver and gold is his. All the earth is his. Hey, we have an inheritance. Do you know, as a child of God, you have an inheritance which no one else has. You see, you're a child of the owner of everything. Now, if you're a child of the owner of everything, and he says no good thing will he withhold, what's your problem? In life, you've got everything. And it works if you start believing it. It only doesn't work when you start getting negative. And lots of people live in negativity all the time. Oh, yeah. oh life's hard. But I find it easy. I, 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 people, when I was a young man, I used to watch television. Hawaii Five O. Things like that, you know? And watch them. Mountie always got his man. I remember those in the early days of television. 1950, 51. You know? And, and, and all those things. And I, I used to think, I'd love to go. I've, I've been. There's nowhere I haven't been. Uh, I've been to all five continents in the world. I've traveled. Why? But all the earth's gods, so I like to go and look at what's mine too. It's nice. No good thing. I mean, I've been in Hawaii. 
boring place. Golf courses are nice. It's boring. All, all you can do is sit in the sun until you're roasted like a lobster. I mean, that's ridiculous. I, I enjoy going snorkeling out in the beach, you know, and looking down at, at all the corals and the beautiful fish and f that come and feed out of your hand. And it's glorious, you know, the water is warm as bath water. You can see 40 foot down below, clear as crystal. I enjoyed it. And I enjoyed going, I enjoyed looking at it. I mean, when, when I saw what my inheritance was, it's mine. No good thing will he withhold from those that love him and walk upright. So I went. I've enjoyed life. There's, there's, the, life is, is so full when you're a Christian. Anything you want to do, you can do. Huh? Some things I don't want to do. I went to Fiji and, and I made an acquaintance with mosquitoes. I nearly ate my blinking ankles. I mean, they were round my ankles. I said to my wife afterwards, you know, that I couldn't believe it. They didn't come up to knee height, fortunately. They just nip your ankles all the time. Sitting out in the open air in the stadium. Thought, well, it's mine. I, I didn't get dominion over those fleas. Mosquitoes, they can... But I will next time. I'm going to take some repellent stuff. I'll kill them. Now I know they're there. I didn't know they were there at the time. Went to Australia. Do you know, in Australia, we had such a good time. And as we were leaving, the one thing I wanted to see, I said, I want, I'd like to see a wild kangaroo. And as I was driving out of where we were staying, bounding along the center of the road, was a wild kangaroo. Went up to 40 kilometers an hour. Boy, it could go. I've always wanted to see one. I don't, I don't like seeing things in the zoo. When I was in South Africa, we went to the game park. Went and saw all the animals out in the wild. I love it. I love that time. It's, it's my inheritance. See, my father owns it. All the earth's his. I like to know what's mine too. I'm his child. Glory to God, this is mine. Do you think that way? I do. I think, oh, it's good. When I get out and I, I go, so I just like being, you know, I don't look at it and say, oh, you know, God's made such a wonderful nature. I just like to look at it and say, it's all mine. You know, my father owns it. This is my inheritance. And, and my whole life is, is full of joy. Things, I, I don't look at things and think, I can't have it. I look at things and think, I've already got it. Huh? And that way, you can live a very happy life. Sometimes I looked out the plane window as we were going across the mountains. It's all mine. No matter where I go, it's mine. See? Why? Because it belongs to God. I'm God's son. I'm an inheritor of the promises. No good thing will he withhold from me. Hmm? No, it depends whether you've got faith. You might have faith to be miserable and poor. I just say, oh, I don't know, you know. To me, I just look at it and say, hmm. when I go places, I'm amazed. It's easy. Depends whether you have faith. If you believe what God says, or you believe what man teaches you. Hmm. Uh, Psalm 36, look at this. Psalm 36. Uh, verse 5, thy, thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens, and thy faithfulness reaches unto the clouds. Do you know, that's one good thing. 
uh, when we went to Australia, they told us they hadn't had any rain and everything was dry for months. Fortnight before I got there, they had two inches of rain. Everything was beautifully green when I arrived. Why? God knew I was coming. <laughs> everything was a dust bowl. Two weeks before we got there, two inches of rain. Everything was beautiful, green. Well, God wanted me to see my inheritance in the best light. Uh, I know, <laughs> you know, his goodness reaches up to the clouds. Thy righteousness is like the great mountains. Thy judgments are a great deep. O Lord, thou preservest man and beast. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house, and thou shalt make them drink of the river of thy pleasure. You know, the thing that's important to understand is if you really want satisfaction and you want it abundantly, you better realize it's in the fatness of his house, not in the fatness of yours. Do you hear what I said? The reason people live in poverty, the reason people live in difficulty, is they don't realize they should live off the fatness of God's house, not the fatness of their house. Uh, that's why you begin to have faith. God owns everything, all the silver and gold's his, all the earth's his, and all the fullness thereof. Everything is God's. It's better to live off the abundance that God has than the poverty that you have, isn't it? Huh? If you switch from your provision to God's provision, you'll find you have a very happy life. If you live by your provision, you'll always be in need. But, verse 8, They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house, and thou shalt make them drink of the river of thy pleasures. For with thee is the fountain of life, in thy light shall we see light. I just believe in the fatness of thy house. Uh, and because I've always believed that, uh, it's always God, and everything belongs to God, and I'm a child of God, and no good thing will he withhold from me, and all the silver and gold is his, and all the fullness of the earth is his. And he intends me to be satisfied with the fatness of his house. Therefore, I have a source that no one knows of. I don't live by my resources, I live by his. I live totally believing in God's faithfulness, God's resources, God's goodness. Um, and I don't worry about mine. If you live by yours, you'll always be in want. If you live by his, you can't ever run dry. Uh, and it's a difference between being a Christian who's got redemption, because redemption brings you into right. Uh, and it's the difference between being a Christian living by your resources and a Christian who believes in God's resources. Some of you are looking at me mystified. It's better to live... Look, if you go and... Let, let me give you an example. If you go and you've got a bank account and you live by what's in your bank account, it's a very meagre supply, isn't it, really? Considering what the bank's got. But if you live by the resources that belong to all the bank, you've got a lot more, haven't you? Now imagine you live by the resources of all the financial powers in the world. You'd be not really worried about what you haven't, haven't got, would you? If you owned it all, would you worry about what you've got? Now, can you imagine... You might have a little house or a little tin shack or wherever you live. And if you live and you think that that's your resources and you live by your little meagre provision, isn't it better to know you're a child of God and you look out there and you say, God, you own this all. When I was in New Zealand, we went up into the mountain and we looked over in, in uh, Christchurch, we looked over the whole plain Look down the coast, beautiful beaches, 
Look around the place. Look to the lovely lakes. Sumhai. You say, well, you've only got a house. No, 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 no. My father owns all this. <laughs> he said, I'm going to be satisfied with the fatness of thy house. I mean, my house is skinny. His house is fat. I, and I begin to believe God. I begin to realize I'm created in the image and likeness of God. God's looking at the earth. He, he says, look, the earth's my footstool. You know, I can go where God's feet are. I sit on his throne because I share it. But then if I want somewhere to put my feet, I know the earth sees fullness. Everything he owns. And no good thing will he withhold. I, I, I find that's faith. Hmm? It works for me. I, I see it. That's redemption. I, I'm redeemed for that. I'm not redeemed for poverty. I'm not redeemed for misery. I, I'm redeemed to prosper and be in health. Hmm? I'm not redeemed for struggle. I'm, I'm redeemed to sit down on the throne. I'm in the image and likeness of God. God's not saying, I wonder if I own the earth. He's not saying, you know, son doesn't say to father, Father, you know, can I borrow ten bob? <laughs> he owns everything. Do you understand? It's yours. And if you're a child of God and you're truly redeemed, you live out of the fatness of God's house. You shouldn't be living out of the fatness of yours. That's the difference between a man of faith and a man of um, fear. Look, Mark it in your Bible, they shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house, and thou shalt make them drink of the river of thy pleasures. Do you know, because you're in the image and likeness of God, you get the same pleasures as God. And you drink of those pleasures. You know, God delights in many things. You want to read sometimes in the Bible, uh, get a concordance and look at the things that God delights in. And then you'll know what's pleasurable. We're a peculiar treasure to God. God. God really delights in you. God delights in what you do that's right. God delights in having you. God delights in your response. God's delighted. God's not miserable. God's not downtrodden. God's not you know, crestfallen. God doesn't feel unhappy. God's really happy. Jesus is delighted. God's always on our side. God's for me. No good thing will he withhold. Do you believe it? Live off the fatness of thy house? Do you believe it? Huh? That's what a Christian life is. Christian life is turning from self unto God. A Christian life is, is coming to dependence on God. Christian life is trusting God. Christian life is, hey, just a minute, I was made in the image and likeness of God. What God likes, I like. I, I'm a peculiar treasure. Above all the people of the earth, there's no one like a Christian. Huh. Why? Because we belong to God. We've been redeemed. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, has purchased us. We're not our own. We've been bought with a price. We're children of God. Servants go in and out the house. The sun stays forever. <laughs> we have a right to live that no one else has. I would that above all things you'll prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. That's God's will for my life. God's will for my life is me to understand what redemption's really purchased for me. I really am a child of God. I really am a son. I am an inheritor of the promises. 
every promise of God in Christ Jesus is yes and amen, isn't it? And I am a child of God. So everything that God owns, I own. Everything that God is, I have. I'm created in his image and likeness. I'm not in his fullness, but I'm in his likeness. I'm in his image. And that's why I can rejoice. All my life is given over to happiness. Not the happiness of happenings, but the joy of God. I just, I just find it, there is in me such a joy. I, I just find it joyful. When I, when I fly and I get up in a plane, I don't worry about, you know, whether it's going to crash or not. Because, you see, the grace of God reaches to the clouds. No, there's no way, you know, to fall out the sky. You know, other planes might fall, mine can't. You know, God's for me. Um, and if it were to fall out the sky, why? I'd have gone home to glory long before it hit the earth. Why? Because when Jesus comes, I'll be caught up to meet him. And if it's my time to go, I'll go. Nothing can take us by chance. No good thing will he withhold. So you can think of the greatest thing in life. And you can say, God, that's really good. And before you'll ask, he's already sent the answer. James says you ask and receive not because you ask amiss. I look at things and say, that was good for me. Glory to God. It was good for me to be in Australia, New Zealand, Fiji. Good for me to take a holiday in Hawaii. Good for me to go to Disney World, go to Florida. Good for me. Good for me. I, I, God says, you know, it's good for you. I won't withhold it. Good for me to have fun, isn't it? It was good for me that there was a big blue trout sitting in the river, 14 pound. Good for me. No good thing will he withhold. Other people walked around that river, they couldn't catch it. That was reserved for me. Had my name down its side. This is for Michael. Keep your feeding hands off. And, and so it hid. No one else could find it. It was reserved for me. Because God's, God's reserves things for me. No, I, I'm a great believer in God. God's goodness. And honestly, he loves you as much. You're a peculiar treasure. Look at the person next to you and say, you're real peculiar, you are. <laughs> and a treasure. That's the amazing thing. God treasures what's odd. Uh, God treasures you uh, and it's all yours redemption's bringing a realisation I think most people have got redemption as forgiveness of sins and haven't understood what God really is and what he's bringing us back to hey he's bringing us back to our inheritance he put Adam and Eve in a beautiful garden gave them everything he's put us on the earth and he says <laughs> The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And he says, come on children, enjoy it. All the treasures are his. Okay? Isn't that a nice redemption? Huh? Isn't it nice to live that way? Look at something and say, oh, that's just made for me. That's right. You know, the trouble is with people, they, they, they've got such a stingy attitude with God. It's evil. Poverty's never done anyone any good. Hasn't. God never intended poverty. If God intended poverty, New Jerusalem wouldn't have streets paved with gold. It wouldn't be decked with fine jewels and pearls, would it? 
Poverty is not a good thing. That's anti-God. And I'm created in the image and likeness of God. I, I, I want to like the things God likes. You want to change your attitude. Some Christians will get to heaven and they'll say, Oh God, give me some rags. So what are you doing? You know, well, I, I'm humble. God will say, stop your nonsense. You know, the beggars he brought into the wedding feast, he said, clothe them. When he found someone who was clothed in, in rags, he said, you don't belong here. Get out of it. That's not the way to live. Huh? You can't help someone and lift them up if you're in the gutter yourself. You can't really relieve someone. If you're so sick, what are you going to say to people? Oh, God's good. Uh, he gives me grace to suffer. People, people don't want to go to church and find that the pastor's in a wheelchair looking as though he's about to die. He comes to you and he says, oh, it's wonderful. You know, I've just got this, that and the other wrong. And We're in the image and likeness of... Hmm? Doesn't come in... Can you imagine Jesus saying to God one morning oh father I've got a headache well, yeah. it's, ter it's a hard life I think it's easy hmm? fullness and lightness of what time's lunch it's now okay well uh, lunch is now but um, you'll get notes you'll get notes of uh, and if you look on the notes, you'll discover that the notes don't bear any relation to what I've said. Um, because, because if they did, I might as well just give you the notes and you go and read the scriptures. What I'm doing is applying it in a practical sense to your life. And then when you get the notes and you answer the questions, apply it in a practical sense. What I'm not doing is taking notes and just preaching from them because there's no point in having notes. You might as well just take the notes and go home. All I'm trying to do is wake up your brain. Start thinking like a Christian should think. It's not an arrogance to start believing God, is it? It's a stupidity. I find it an affront to God to suggest that God's mean. I find it an affront to God to suggest that God will withhold things from us. I find it a affront to God to suggest that his will won't be fulfilled in our lives. I find it an affront to God to suggest that we should somehow fail. It's all wrong. We need to have the positive gospel. It's good news. Good news is, if you're poor, he's going to make you rich. The good news is, if you're down, he's going to lift you up. The good news is, if you're sick, he's going to heal you. The good news is, if you're bound, you're going to be free. The good news is, he's breaking the power of sin and bringing you into the power of life. The good news is, you're going to be in the image and likeness of God. The good news is, it's good. And God is good. Okay.